Red Cloud Financial Services is your preeminent source for mining industry opportunities. The team provides a unique tailored marketing program dedicated to reaching the right people from its mining-focused global network, giving clients access to industry-leading events and conferences, retail and institutional marketing, plus an in-house growth-driven digital agency. Red Cloud Financial Services has access to some of the mining industry's most notable companies and CEOs. Hello and welcome to this live core conversation brought to you by Red Cloud Financial Services. I'm Mark Bunting. I'll be your host. Uh, I'm also the host of uh, RCTV. A bit of a change of pace today. We are talking about predatory short selling in the Canadian junior mining sector. Uh, our guest today uh, says it is a systemic and egregious problem. He is the founder of uh, Save Canadian Mining. He's the CEO of Power Nickel. Uh, and uh, he says uh, for the last three years or so, as uh, the face and the, the, the spearheader, so to speak, of Safe Canadian Mining, he and his colleagues have tried a civilized approach with regulators, politicians, uh, banking executives, and he's hitting brick walls. So now we're going into the brawl phase and Terry's going to get into that. Let's bring in uh, Terry Lynch. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good, to, good to be here, Mark. Uh, I feel I should be wearing boxer shorts as a, you know, <laughs> and uh, kick, taking my uh, dukes out here. But uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, like Mike uh, Tyson come into the ring in his prime. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, just as a table setter, for, for those who may not be that familiar with uh, uh, naked short selling, predatory short selling in uh, the junior mining sector uh, in Canada, can you describe the, the scale and the scope of it and, and why it's it's such an issue? Yeah, so let's set the stage. So, uh, you know, from a um, commodity market perspective, we're actually in a pretty healthy commodity market, sort of top quartile. So it's not at the top, but it's pretty healthy. Uh, ordinarily at this time of the cycle, you'd expect to see mining stocks doing very well. Uh, yet, if you look at the TSXV, which is, you know, let's use that as a uh, an indicator, it's bumping along the bottom. So literally uh, as bad as it's ever been in the history of, it, of the index. So something's wrong. You know, there's something fundamentally different this time. You know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a you know Rick Rules, a fairly legendary figure in this sector, and he says the cure for low prices is low prices, and you know he's right most of the time. But in this case, uh, I'm not sure that the cure for low prices is low prices right now. The cure is really fixing the regulatory problems that we've got in this sector, and uh, the magnitude of the, of the you know the size of the issue. Uh, we did a study at Save Canadian Mining. Um, a reputable research firm was uh, retained, and we basically showed that uh, historically, the uh, TSXV's uh, TSX Metals and Mining Index used to track uh, and track the commodity price indexes. So it makes common sense, right? We're in the mining sector; makes sense that mining stocks would follow along closely with the commodities themselves. So the base and precious metals. So uh, where do you think we're at today? Well, I can tell you, we're, we're basically a third. So we used to be, you know, so that, uh, you know, we've lost about somewhere in the $50 billion uh, of market cap for mining uh, companies. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a tremendous, obviously, loss of investor capital. It's also uh, a lack of capital for the sector. So they're not going out and making new exploration discoveries. They're not advancing mines to production and it's crippling the system. And it's not just a mining issue. I mean, obviously, we're miners. We're talking about safe Canadian mining, but it's a safe Canadian small cap issue, really. But uh, that's the, the magnitude of the, uh, the problem in mining. The Globe did an article about a week ago or two weeks ago where they talked about a trillion dollar outflow in Canadian equities in the last uh, 10 years. So that gives you an over, oversight of the magnitude of the overall problem. And we've got some theories about what's really happening here. And we're, we've gone to the regulators, we've gone to the politicians, and they uh, they've done nothing. Let's be frank. Uh, you know, they've uh, met us, been hospitable, that sort of thing. But the reality is they are not dealing with the problem. Whereas in South Korea, uh, they they shut it down like in a week. Boom. And, and, and they've dealt with it. And they've dealt with us in 16 other countries around the world. 
So what's wrong with Canada? Terry, a real world example of this uh, short selling you're talking about is the the so-called uh, 1559 tick down. Uh, some people call it the CIBC kiss because apparently CIBC is often involved with these trades. And you've said that uh, Power Nickel, as an example, was the victim of this at one point. Seven straight sessions at 1315, uh, sorry, 1559, the stock goes down. So uh, can you can you sort of elaborate on that and, and how that works? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's it's one of these things that's super frustrating when you're a company, because if, if I bought the stock up seven days in a row, I would be put in jail like real quick. <laughs> but these guys seem to be able to knock it down seven days in a row or uh, and that's not just power nickel. It's 60 percent of the companies across the space in any particular day. And it's like, uh, you know, how does one broker and there's, I don't know how many brokers, there must be 30, 50 brokers in Canada. How does one broker even statistically get the last trade, the last second, the last fraction of a second for seven days in a row? The odds on that are infinitesimal. I don't know how that happens. I'd phone zero when that happened to us. And, you know, and I said, guys, this is beyond ridiculous. And I know you're going to say, oh, we've checked and it's not the same guy, but it's like, hello, wake the hell up. Of course, it's the same group of people working together. This is not, this just doesn't happen statistically. And it's, as I said, it, it's, it's just, uh, it's gone beyond ridiculous. And now we know what's causing it. And so, so now we're going to bring them home to, to tell them the, the real truth here. Now you've been spearheading this fight for about uh, three years. And, and you, know, you said that uh, you've tried the civilized route with regulators, politicians, banking executives, and you've gotten nowhere uh, hitting brick walls, uh, so to speak. So, uh, and you're going into the brawl phase, uh, and we'll get to that in a while, next stages. But why do you think you're, you're, they've been cordial, but just have not acted at all? Oh, there's a, you know what? Honestly, that's one of the great mysteries, really, because it's in nobody's interest for this to continue, right? Least of all the big banks who are probably the biggest, you know, sort of uh, uh, cause of it. You know, because if they wanted to change something, the big banks can change anything in this country. And they obviously have not decided to change this rule for reasons that are only known to them. But the reality is, if you look at that Globe article and they say the billion dollars or a trillion dollars has come into the Canadian capital markets in the last 10 years, statistically, we know 90 percent of that would be with the big banks. So they're really they're hurting themselves in the long run. But in the short run, yeah, the quarterly profits would probably go down a little bit because they've been making a ton of money, allowing this short sellers to prey upon uh, investors across the country. And that's been destructive, you know, so they make money in the short end, but they're not making it in the long run. And that's what's killing the whole economy. So, you know, we, I think we've we really sort of got to focus on what's you know good for society and, 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 and go for all good for our economy. And we get back to sort of traditional capitalism where good companies get rewarded for doing good things, whether it be finding new resources and make, moving them productively along the line and bad companies get punished. That's OK. We're OK with capitalism. That's what got us here. But we're not doing that right now. Right now, we have cronyism and we've got massive market manipulation. Now, this brawl phase that you're going into uh, involves a plan to, as you say, essentially embarrass regulators, politicians, uh, banking executives as well. And part of that is uh, you're working well with a law firm that specializes in class action lawsuits and you're hoping to get hundreds of uh, Canadian junior minors to become involved. So can you uh, elaborate on, on your plans and what you're doing. Yeah, we're really going at a sort of a three uh, step process here. So the first step is basically to uh, embarrass the uh, the regulators, the politicians and the banks that are allowing this to happen on their watch. And we'll be doing such things as, you know, you know, the, all the junior mining companies that are getting the down tech at 15, 59, 59 by CIBC or whoever is doing it. Uh, it will be we'll be having those companies uh, repost uh, that tick down. And we'll be then asking their shareholders to tweet a very specific set of uh, tweets, like stop the CIBC kiss or, you know, something crafty that the marketing geniuses will come up with that we're working on. Uh, and we'll be basically, you know, purposely saying, showing how ridiculous this is and how much damage it's causing. And uh, it, one thing, if six people do it, it's another thing if 600 people do it or 60,000 people do it, because that's the type of energy we're going to bring to this. We're going to take the convoy like energy to solving this for all of uh, Canadian uh, investors and savers across the country because their stocks are getting trashed. And this is the cost. And so we're going to start to show that on a daily basis. 
And I'm going to tell you, it's going to get bloody frustrating if you're a bank executive or a regulator or a politician, start getting 60,000 tweets in your inbox, embarrassing you every day. I think it's going to get old real quick. The other thing we're going to do is and part of this whole uh, dance is uh, another part of the short selling issue is spoofing. And, you know, again, we're getting into some technical terms, which can sound sort of, um, you know, out there for, you know, the general investment public. But think of it if you've ever looked at uh, stocks as they're, as they're trading and then you see some monster bids on the sell and you think, wow, I wonder why people are selling. Because, you know, the only reason why people sell stocks is because they think the stock's going down mostly. And maybe there's some personal you know, financial liquidity issue they have to deal with. But generally, our perception is selling is because you know they they have uh, they're they've got another view on the stock. So the the, the the saying in the industry selling begets selling is is quite common. So what happens in spoofing is they have fake sell orders, okay. And when you try and actually hit them and actually bring investors to them, they disappear. That's called spoofing, okay. That happens all the time, and we've got twenty four cases of it that we're going to start to show real companies that have been spoofed that we did the research on and it's like hey how about that for evidence mr regulator why don't you wake the hell up you know so so it's like you know this is the type of stuff that unfortunately you know i mean do you think i i really have the time or really want to be doing this i mean i want we've got a great company in power nickel we're trying to focus our energies on that uh you know but you know this is such a you know uh terrible malfeasance on our society that it just has to be stopped and, and, I, and I think at this point, you know, all of our mining uh, peers, we've been crushed enough and we're, we're sick of it. We're, we're going we're gonna to call it out. We're going to embarrass these guys. And we tried to do it the nice way, but that's not work. So we're going to have to bring them home to medicine here. And, and when their brands start to hurt, maybe they'll wake up. I hope so. Right. So you're uh, mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. Like uh, the it's line like Peter Finch. <laughs> the movie network. We're old enough to remember that. That's too, um, no, so, that's scary, Mark. Very scary. I know. Um, so, but you call this staggering malfeasance and that the regulators, banks, governments, uh, they're terrified of this being exposed. So can you continue with that theme? Like, why are they terrified? <laughs> well, listen, um, nobody wants to be um, on the front lines of having this type of, um, uh, you know, a skullduggery, uh, bad behavior allowed. Okay, somebody's dropped the ball here. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we tried to sort of like deal with them in a way to allow them to clean up the ball. Like nobody was trying to embarrass anybody for three and a half years. Okay, that hasn't worked. Okay, so now we've got no choice. Okay, so now we're going to embarrass you guys, and you know, because the public is going to be pissed off. They've lost a trillion dollars. They should be pissed off, and it's like it's somebody's somebody's mistake. Now, it's like, you know, I, I was talking with the Ford government, you know, and we made had some good conversations with them. They didn't cause the problem. Nobody in office today has caused this problem, to be fair to the politicians. But they're in the hot seat. It's their job to solve problems that happened even before they came. They do it in other issues, okay? Why are they not doing it with our savings? What could be more critical than, you know, is and it's like not just for investors. Think of the tax dollars that are lost by this capital destruction and uh, you know, the jobs that are not taking place. So it's not just investors that invest in the stock market. It's every citizen in Canada that's being punished here. And it's, it's just got to stop. So that's, that's the whole moral perspective here is, is that, uh, you know, unfortunately they, they, they've not woken up any other way. So we feel we've got no choice as companies that want to survive and want to see capital markets that are fair and just for all Canadians. We've got to bring these issues front and center to them until it just gets so painful that they make the change. There's one particular issue that's called the short market exempt. And I don't know if we're going to touch on that, but I'd love to. Well, let, let's keep going with that then, the, the short market exempt. Okay, so what is short market exempt? So basically, um, I think we have a fairly you know, uh, great track record in Canada of treating people equally. Doesn't matter your sexual orientation, the color of your skin, your religious orientation, everyone gets treated equally. Do you agree that that's sort of the Canadian way, Mark? Sure. I agree, yeah. Okay. So why would we treat investors not equally? But that's what we do. Okay. And the short market exempt is a perfect example of that. So what happens in the short market exempt? And this is something that we learned 
just in the last few months. I mean, it's stunning that we didn't know this, but you know, I mean, we're building mining companies or, or other enterprises and we're, this is not our day-to-day -day thing. But I, I learned in the last few months that since 2012, if you rent pipe, i.e. algo trading pipe from CIBC, TD or Merrill Lynch, the major pipe providers in our country for algorithmic trading for computer to computer, bots to bots, so to speak, that those traders automatically get short market exempt status. What is short market exempt? It means you basically can become a market maker. So you're wondering, like, I mean, how is it possible that you get all these, you know, uh, shares trading on these small companies? And you're thinking, well, are they borrowing the stock? Well, it's very tough to borrow junior mining stock. Well, they don't have to. It's called the short market exempt and they can hit any bid. OK, and they've been hitting these bids for the last umpteen years. I think it accelerated through the cannabis debacle. And then after cannabis got crushed, they, they turned their attention on the, you know, on mining and we've been crushed, you know, so it's, it's really, a, it's a, it's a horrific rule. There's just no justification for treating investors differently. There's no justification for allowing some investors to have privileges that others don't have and allow them to, because what happens when you, you have massive selling in normal investors think, Hey, people are selling, uh, you know, power nickel stock in the droves. Why would they be doing that? Must be something wrong with the company. I should sell too. Selling begets selling. So this is why, even though our, our commodity markets are top quartile, our stock markets are at the at the floor. There's phenomenal deals. I mean, you guys are in the mining space. You know how many tremendous discoveries have been made in Canada, and they're at, are just trading at pennies on the dollar. It's it's disgusting, you know. And it's like wow. And and now the world needs our resources more than ever. We should be rocking and rolling, and and most of us are dying. You know, not power nickel, thanks God, but you know, it, it, it's 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 high time for us to get behind it, an industry wide change here, and that's what we're trying to push forward. Terry, we don't want to go too far into the weeds here, but uh, could could you just give us a, a snapshot of this lawsuit from Mr. Buckhold, who for years has been in the uh, capital markets business, asset management, and essentially, am I right in saying that there's sort of a an element uh, in this lawsuit whereby it, it's alleged that this this amounts to organized criminal activity. Yeah, I mean, we're we're going to do a podcast on safe Canadian mining and and and, and uh, with uh, Murray and 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 have him in his own words walk us through this. And I, you know, I I I didn't know Murray from Adam. He, he approached me uh, maybe a year and a half ago or so because he had learned about safe Canadian mining and and that's sort of how I've you know stumbled into this world is. You know Danny Guy and 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 you know Eric Sprott, all these people sort of came out of the woodworks to support the, the issue. They all came at it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, but with Murray's case, I mean, you mean that that the organized crime uh, you know mention is something from the Department of Justice in the United States. This is not Murray's words, you know. So so there there's some uh, pretty serious allegations there. They're yet before the court, and and uh, they'll in the fullness of time they'll be heard and and understood. But if you read the affidavits uh, and and whatnot, it's it's pretty damning, you know. And and uh, you know, I, I uh, I'm no uh, lawyer, uh, you know, but you know, just as a simple uh, you know business person reading through it, uh, it's terrifying to me that that our systems have been abused this way, seemingly. And and uh, uh, I I think it's uh, uh, it's 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 shocking, really. And and uh, you know, but that's the type of exposure that we need to bring to the system and to our, you know, our citizens so that they can see that, hey, you know, we've been being played here and 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 some of our regulators, some of our politicians, possibly some of our banks have not been playing by the rules and and, and need to be you know, punished and called out. Uh, and uh, the, these these uh, crimes need to be dealt with. And uh, uh, that's the type of stuff that we you know, we're going to, as, as you said, we talk about the brawl phase. It's really, really fundamentally trying to embarrass them to make the move into action because we've tried everything else. We've tried talking to them. We tried giving them market research. Uh, we tried lobbying with them, uh, you know, and uh, that's not worked. So uh, yet the problem's gotten worse and uh, it just doesn't seem that we should sit back any further. Now we have to... Uh, move to this other phase of disclosing these uh, really unseemly issues that, uh, you know, ultimately should have been disclosed in any event and need to be solved. Uh, but uh, 
it's going to be embarrassing for them and they better deal with it. It's going to get worse before it gets better for them. And uh, Terry, is there a timeline for this class action lawsuit to be filed? You know, uh, we're we're going through uh, due diligence right now uh, with the law firm. Uh, it, it takes a quite a bit of work to file a class action. This is a multi-million dollar investment over time. So we're, uh, there's about a $100,000 expense that we're undertaking right now to to do the research to see if we can practically uh, uh, build and lay a case uh, uh, that we have a, we believe, a overwhelming chance of winning as a class action. So we're, we're doing that. This That step's underway right now. We expect that to take another couple months worth of uh, legal research. Again, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert, but we, we've been working with some legal experts that are quite uh, sophisticated and, and, and proficient in this area. And we expect to get guidance from them in a, in a couple of months and do that. So uh, at that point, we'll be able to speak in a more fulsome way about that. And our ambition here is uh, not to uh, in, engorge ourselves with any sort of fiscal uh, benefit from this. It's really to, it, you know, again, if they're not going to stop for any other reason, then maybe they have to be punished fiscally to stop. You know, it's just a tool to change the rules. Like, you know, if for, for me, when I started this thing, it was never about blaming anyone, pointing fingers. It was just to say, hey, guys, there's a massive problem here. Clearly, you know, anybody with common sense could say, why would commodity markets be so high and stock markets so low? OK, it's just not congruent. So there is a big problem. You can't explain that away, period. There's a problem. Let's deal with the problem. But they just refuse to deal with the problem. So what can we do? Uh, you've been the face of this uh, battle for more than three years now, and you're going to stay a part of it. But you've also said it's sort of gone beyond you and you've done what you can to this point and that uh, uh, you and your colleagues would like to find a managing director, a killer, as you call them, uh, or a pit bull and or a pit bull. So is there an active search going on right now? And what kind of person are you looking for? And, and uh, has anybody approached? Yeah, yeah we, we've, we've got an active search going on right now. And, and we, we've we got a, a we're zeroing in a, on a candidate that would be ideal. Um, and, uh, you know, what we need probably more than anything else is that, you know, I, I feel sometimes when I talk, they, they say, well, Terry's talking his book. He's in he's in Power Nickel and he's in other mining companies. And, you know, he's, he wants to get a stock up there. And this is all just a ploy to do that. And, you know, uh, you know, that's a fair perspective. One could take that. Uh, you know, that's not the case, but one could at least understand that concept. And so I think it's in some respects, we, we need to sort of go outside the industry to sort of an unimpeachable figure that that could you, where, where, where this when this person says, hey, there's something seriously wrong here. Uh, we could look at him and say uh, or her and, and say, well, that person is very credible. They would not be saying this unless they'd done their homework and were convinced this was the case, you know. Terry may be talking his book, but this guy, you know, this guy's or this girl, gal is super credible and, 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 and um, you know, is trustworthy. And so we're going to get that spokesperson who's trustworthy to Canadians across the board, rich or poor, investor, non-investor. That's what we need, that type of breath. And we need somebody that can work at 24-7, 365, because honestly, you know, I don't have enough hours in the day. I mean, Power Nickel's on a ridiculously fantastic uh, discovery. And, and I've got, uh, you know, a big chunk of the, the Lynch family wealth is in it. So uh, and for my shareholders, I need to be devoting 150 percent of my time to power nickel, you know. And and uh, and so but I feel like we've we've pushed this cause so far and the and the and the uh, malfeasance is so egregious. And now that we know how it's done and it can be fixed, you know, that we just have to get, uh, you know, roll up the sleeves and give it one more push. But I think we need to have a permanent uh person to, to sort of uh, be the MD and, and, you know, and, and, and people like myself and Eric Sprott and Rob McEwen, Keith Neumeyer, Sean Rosen, and, and, and a number of others, John Chisholm, many, many industry people will come to support this person and support them in many ways. And we'll be there. You know, so we're not backing off. We're just saying, Hey, we're all busy running our businesses, which is what we should be doing. But the cause needs a full-time uh, person, full-time attention. And it's moved to that stage. So we're going to raise the funds to do that. So we'll be going out uh, in two parts, basically, to uh, junior mining companies. And they'll be putting in between five and 25000 cash or stock 
into the into the into the fund that'll fund you know the 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 salary that will pay this this person plus we'll provide some uh, options we'll provide yeah i expect we'll get at least 100 companies behind this and we'll give you know 50,000 options a piece or something like that so the person has an incentive to deliver the goods because if they do then obviously these mining companies are going to go up because they're all savagely underpriced to the most part right now uh, so there'll be a good incentive package for the person that's and that's warranted we need you know you pay peanuts you get monkeys okay we we're going to pay to get a really great person that's only going to be associated with it because he believes or she believes in the cause and and then then we'll want to give them the tools and support they need to be successful because you know we've done the research we've done the, the work we've caught the malfeasance you know you know we're ready to sort of finish this off and and turn this around and the thing I would like to leave with the audience tonight is, you know, uh, because I know a, a big chunk of, of your audience is obviously mining investors. People might be thinking, God, I got to get out of this market. I'm of the other view. This is so bad, it's good. OK, and uh, and the best move in investment is to going from bad to less bad. That's about to happen in mining across the board. So, um, you know, I believe this this problem is is so bad now that we're going to solve it, that there's going to be so much energy put into getting it unsolved and we're making it so uh, exposed that th these guys don't like sunlight, okay? We're gonna give them a ton of sunlight, okay? Not just me, but this new group that's gonna come in that's gonna push it. We're gonna empower them to push it and we're gonna get this problem solved. And when we do, we're gonna have the biggest mining boom in history. So I, I said last uh, year at VRIC, uh, I think we talked then, I, I said, I, I pushed half my chips in. And then, and then you know, in, at PDAC, I said, I pushed the rest in. I'm all in in this market. I think now is the great time, greatest time. And if you can't buy individual stocks, buy some of the great mining funds out there. Buy, you know, Palace Capital, buy BT Global, buy, buy dynamic funds. You know, there, there's some great funds out there that'll do great jobs for you in investing in the sector. And they'll go up as well. You know, don't miss this. because This will be a life-changing, uh, life-altering uh, financial return for you. And you deserve it because you've been beaten up for the last 10 years. Terry, we talked about, I think it was seven months ago or so, when the shares of Power Nickel were sitting around 23 cents, and you were telling investors, get off your wallet, because when when this moves and when other stocks move, they're really going to explode. And uh, Power Nickel got to, I believe, around uh, 90 cents or so. And full disclosure, I think there was a board earlier, but I, I own shares in, in Power Nickel. But um, you, you have seen, <laughs> Yeah, I know. Big, big surprise. Probably a lot more, way more than me, that's for sure. Um, but uh, you've seen many cycles in your time. And and do you think, uh, I'm just curious here, just from a market perspective, with the Fed rate cut, maybe another one coming, China stimulus, uh, commodity stocks uh, and commodities are starting to move now. So does this seem like the real deal uh, at this moment, kind of a, a, a shift in the market? Yeah, like I mean, like I said, I, I firmly believe now it's the time to uh, make your investments. And, you know, you decide, you know, personally, whether you can go into the individual stocks like the power nickels of the world, or or if you feel more comfortable in a basket, like a, a in a, a mutual fund or possibly an ETF um, in the sector, I think it's just a tremendous time because you know I think tech stocks are toppy. Uh, I wouldn't be buying tech stocks right now. They've had a tremendous run, and they'll probably have you know more to do in the future. But if you look at the the charts, they'll, they'll typically say. Tech is the tech. The tech to commodity divergence never been higher than it is today, and uh, and when that turns, it, it it it's often quite savage, and and that'll just triple quadruple stocks just on the turn. So so if you get in the right ones, it could be really uh, phenomenal, and I, I expect there'll be ten baggers and hundred baggers, and it won't be uncommon. So uh, yeah, I'm 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 bullish. I mean, as you know, I'm long and therefore recommend, as they say. But but yeah, no, I I think there's a Fundamental common sense tells us it's a great time to be uh, looking at mining stocks, and uh, there's a number of ways to play it. Okay, lastly here, uh, Terry, put your CEO cap on, if you could, uh, with the Power Nickel and uh, the big project in Quebec. We know that you recently expanded the high-grade polymetallic Lion Zone. I believe you, uh, the, the size of it went up quite a bit. Yeah, so yeah, we, we ex expanded about fifty percent, and uh, uh, we'll expect to. We said we'd start to get assays out at the end of the month, which is September thirtieth. So, uh, think Monday or next week, uh, Monday, uh, Monday, Tuesday. I would expect we'll, we're working on that uh, process right now. So, uh, 
yeah, the lion zone's been ridiculous. Obviously, we started in, you know with the discovery hole of eight meters of uh, almost one ounce PGMs, and then uh, reeled off uh, 16 holes less January to end of April. 15 of 16 hit. Half of those hit were uh, you know almost 10 meters of 10 percent copper equivalent. So truly, you know, uh, unheard of holes. We followed up in the summer with 11 of 13 hits and uh, uh, similar type. Of, we expect a similar type of ratio on the uh, on the really great results. So. Uh, yeah, that that thing has become a, a beast, and uh, we're excited to, to ride the uh, ride the wild beast and see how far she can go. But it, it looks like it's going to be a very big discovery for us, and uh, we're super excited about it. And of course, we're fully funded. We've got uh, we raised twenty million. We got Robert Freeland and Rob McEwen and a bunch of mining funds in, and uh, so we got smart money. We got we were able to get Dr. Steve Beresford in, who's uh, you know probably if he's not the top polymetallic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, scientists in the world, he's in that conversation. And, you know, that's the whole, the reason why the stocks made such a move is we moved from being a nickel story to being a polymetallic story. And, and uh, polymetallics are basically just when, you know, your primary metal, in this case, nickel, is dwarfed in revenue by the sales of, of your other, rev, uh, other uh, commodities. So in our case, it would be copper and noble metals like gold, silver, platinum, palladium. So, uh, so we've, we've really transformed. And these polymetallics can be very big, you know. So, uh, you know, Norilsk is the only trillion dollar uh, institu mine in the world. We've been compared to that. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but, you know, uh, as Steve Bearser said, he's uh, I'm not saying you're going to be the next Norilsk, but if you were to start the next Norilsk, it would start like this. So, I mean, that's a tremendous, uh, you know, opportunity. And we've got, you know, smart money and smart guys, and we're all cashed up. We're, to, as I said, reel off some catalysts of the assays here over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, 30,000 meter drill program coming out. We've got the feasibility study on the on the uh, nickel refinery that's coming out as well. So there's, uh, you know, you want to get into stocks when they're cashed up and they've got catalysts. So that's the power nickel story today. All right, uh, great stuff. And as far as the uh... The main topic at hand here, predatory short selling. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, uh, you know, for the audience that listens, is, is, is that, that you know, this problem, you know, uh, started in 2012 to the large, large part. Um, and uh, it's it's accelerated through the years. And uh, we've now finally figured out what is the head of the snake. It's the short market exempt rule. It needs to stop. We can't let other, you can't have investors treated unequally we don't treat anybody else in our society unequally why would we allow investors to to do that so while it's it's bad i i, I from an investor perspective it's actually a great opportunity for time for you to sort of uh, roll up your sleeves do your due diligence find some great uh, you know junior mining stocks to back or buy some funds as i said so it's uh, it's uh, sort of scary that we have to deal with this issue but hey we're going to deal with it we're on top of it uh we're getting a lot of support across the spectrum from industry from uh, from you know uh, you know people like Red Cloud uh, and other brokers that are now realizing this is a huge problem and we got to save our investors. So so I think uh, you know it's uh, it's so bad it's good. Uh, so that would be the thought I would leave with people that it's uh, don't be uh, unhopeful, be hopeful. Well, you're doing uh, excellent and much needed work, Terry, and thanks for educating us uh, today on this topic. We'll be following and we'll be following the news flow over at Power Nickel as well. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Mark. Have a great night. All right, you too. Thank you very much to uh, Terry Lynch. He is the founder of Safe Canadian Mining and the CEO of Power Nickel. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed that. Uh, watch the replay on YouTube if you missed part of this. Uh, we'll be keep, uh, we're still going to be doing uh, many more of these uh, live core conversations, and uh, we hope you can tune in. Until then, take care for now.